my mum was there, my sister-in-law was there, and they started to beat me. And this was a different kind of beating. It was almost as though they were determined to kill me. And all my life I'd been threatened that we will bury you under these floorboards, and I really believed they would. And within no time, they had broken my jaw. They had broken my arm, and I was in a lot of pain. So my parents originate from the Punjab in North India. They came over in the 1960s, and I always say that they packed very tightly their cultural beliefs. And unfortunately for me, um, that meant that girls were not wanted or desired, but boys were. So I was looked upon as a um, bad entity, almost like a witch or a possessed child. So everyone wouldn't touch me or welcome me or hold me because they felt I was um, carrying bad spirits. Were you the only girl in your household? So I'm the youngest of three. I have two older brothers and I'm the only girl born in my immediate family, but also the only girl in my extended family with my father being one of seven brothers. My normality was such that I was kept in my room at the age of six. My room wasn't like a, ch a, ch a child's bedroom whereby it's got nice furnishings and soft toys. It was very bare brick walls. The only time I was allowed out of my room was to go to school, or my mother would call me to cook, or I would be called to do another chore, like washing the plates or dishes or um, the clothes because we didn't have washing machines. And um, I had no interaction with my family. I didn't make eye contact. Girls are told to look down all the time and I still have a bit of an issue making eye contact with people, um, primarily because we, we get hit if we make eye contact, we get shouted at. So I was non-verbal because I didn't engage in conversation with my family. I had to nod, not speak. I used to press my ear against a very rough wooden door and listen into TV programs and pretend I was sitting with my family. But my friend at school would walk me to school and sing me all the songs from Top of the Pops, and that's how I knew a lot of music. I amused myself with books. I've got a love of books still. Um, I used to take as many books from school as I could because they were my friends. I would name them. And I really believed in fairy tales and that I was Rapunzel and that one day I would be saved from my room. What was your relationship with your parents like? I was very scared of my mother and father and a lot of people don't understand that women play a big role in my community as much as other communities that are like mine and cultures that are like mine whereby the person that would call me out of my room would be my mother, the person that was um, watching a lot of my abuse was my mother and she herself was very angry all the time just by my existence. I wanted to please my father, I would go out of my way to do things to make my father happy and by that I mean I would cook food as quickly as I could and most kids have a toy they remember from their childhood but I remember he brought me back a blue crate that had bottles in it and I turned it upside down which meant when I was a little six-year-old, seven-year-old I could reach everything so much quicker in the kitchen and I felt maybe that was an extension of his love to me as well. Um, and you mentioned that you were able to go to school, what was school like for you? So school should have been an escape and it was to a certain point because of the books and the teachers were quite pleasant. But I was the only person of colour in my school with my brother. So you would hear the word scrap and people running and it was because I was being piled upon and beaten or it was my brother being beaten. My hair was pulled, I was spat upon and every day was a bit of a battle in a different way. Um, I had literally a couple of friends because nobody wanted to be my friend because they too would be picked on. But the ones I had were very loyal and very loving and I wasn't allowed a lunchbox. And my first experience of jam sandwiches, jam sandwiches was because my friend offered me one of hers, knowing that I wasn't getting any food at lunch times. And, you know, I remember making that little jam sandwich last for the whole of the lunchtime so I could be part of the lunchtime community sitting inside instead of sitting on a bench waiting. So my father, from the age of sort of seven upwards, would bring back 
a, f a group of his friends and I knew them all. And in my culture, you don't say names, you say uncle or auntie to anyone that's older than you. And they would come and they would eat and they would drink. And my father owned a lot of pubs. So my father was the place to go to because he had the alcohol. And, you know, he would come back from the pub and my mother was the one who would wake me and say, go down. She would go back to bed and I would go and cook rice and chapatis and chicken and some vegetables. And I would take them on a tray. And then I would sit on the bottom of our large wooden staircase waiting for them to finish because my father didn't like mess. And when I got to 14, um, my mother woke me up and instinctively I had this horrible feeling. I remember taking the food in and waiting and I remember thinking I don't want to go and pick the dishes up because they were exceptionally loud. They'd started to bring bottles outside. My father used to put the empty bottles outside and there was bottles of Johnny Walker all lined up. And then when I did get the call, um, I went in with the big tray that we had. It was a big white tray, probably bigger than me. And he grabbed my wrist and the tray fell down. And he was the first person to throw me onto the table and rape me. I didn't know what was happening. I was too young. I closed my eyes. But I, I lived without um, the ability to see. So I knew each person's sound of who it was, each person's touch almost. And it was a very horrific attack by seven or eight men on me. And I um, was thrown from person to person. I was beaten, I was bitten. And eventually I must have passed out. And when I came to, it was because my mother opened and closed the door and woke me up. And I remember not having my bottom part of my clothes on. And I was literally lying in a bath of my own blood. And the first thing I thought about was, there's food everywhere on the walls, on the floor, and I'm gonna be in so much trouble. I didn't actually give myself any consideration because I believed I wasn't worth anything because that's what they had taught me from birth to believe. You mentioned your mother, so how did she respond straight after this attack? Well, my mother was the one who woke me up. As I said, she opened and closed the door several times. And she was angry, you know. Um, it's all about perception. I look back sometimes and I say, could she have done anything? Um, did she show any act of kindness? And I know that she was the one who gave me a new set of pajamas. Was that an act of kindness or was she just doing that? I don't know, but she could have at some point just come to see me and stroke my hair or give me some comfort, but she was just angry and almost made me feel that it was my fault that I had asked for it, that it was me that had instigated the whole attack. I was so naive, I didn't understand what happened. You know, we don't have conversations about periods or sex or relationships in my culture or cultures like it. It's a taboo to even think about it. So I just knew it was wrong, but I didn't, school back then didn't teach us these things. Um, and all I knew is that it was wrong and I didn't feel like me anymore. She allowed me to have a shower and I was never allowed to shower, my brothers were. Um, they used to make me have bucket baths, which meant you have a bucket and you fill it up and then you use a, a jug to wash yourself. But on this instant, she told me to have a shower. And again, I thought maybe she was being kind, but the shower really stung. So where I'd been bitten, where I had open wounds, it really stung. And I kind of wished I had had the bucket bath. But after that, I had just asked her if I could go to sleep because I was in so much agony. I was in a lot of internal pain, naturally. But the mental pain was almost that I felt broken. I just felt like that was it. That was um, the end of me. And were you living in fear that something might happen again? I used to 
walk in with that tray with my legs shaking from that day forward. So every Friday or Saturday when my father would bring his friends, I was visibly shaking and scared because I was sure they would try to do something again. And then not knowing it's torture, there's no other word for it. But it was always upon me to go and face them every weekend and, and give them this food. I turned 15 and I realised I was pregnant and I told my mum that I was no longer having periods and I didn't know I was pregnant but she told me that I had spoilt myself. Um, my dad was called immediately, he came and they both sent me to my room and they were shouting at each other and before I knew it, I was in the car and I'd never been in my father's car and I remember it was a a blue Humber Scepter and I'm sat in the back looking at the trees and the clouds and wondering where I was going. And they took me somewhere in the West Midlands to a clinic and I remember arriving in the clinic and there were lots of women. I remember the whole procedure and this was the clinic where I was going to have an abortion. The thing I always talk about is the act of kindness from this whole experience of this abortion because it was the first time someone had actually extended love to me. And it was in the form of a lady where, after the procedure, they make everyone sit on a grass verge. And I had my sort of clinic gown on. And she brought me a cup of tea. But it wasn't the tea that she handed me. It wasn't the fact that she handed me tea. It was the fact she reached out and touched my hair and stroked me in a very maternal way. And I think it's, it doesn't matter how old you are, we all crave love. And I realised at that point I really was craving some love from another human. And I realised as well that maybe I wasn't as bad because she didn't catch anything by touching me. And I was told all my life and believed it that if someone touched me they would catch this evilness that I was containing. Um, and when we got home, on the way home, my parents were really upset saying, what are we going to do with her? This is such a problem, nobody will marry her because to get an arranged marriage, you have to be a virgin. And I wasn't a virgin and I blamed myself. So my father was really anxious for a while after the abortion saying that, what will we do? How are we going to do this? What are we going to do with her? And uh, there was talks about me being sent to India where they would either marry me to an older man or kill me. One of the people that had raped me came forward. He was the person that bit me. And he came forward and said that he would take me. He wanted to have me in his house so that he could have me as a sex slave and his wife could have a servant. But his son was dating a white English girl and in our culture that's not allowed, but it's very common. And they were going to have me marry the son so that the community thought that the son was good. It was a sham wedding. It was very rushed, I was very young, but my father and he started to trade, make a trade for me. Um, they placed a silk scarf over my head and I was forced to sit down and I have a few pictures and I look at those pictures and think, what was going through your head? You look so scared. Because I thought when I go to his house, will he call his friends? Will I be a victim again of a group rape? I didn't know what to expect. And, um, my father and he argued about gold and money and eventually they came to an agreement and everyone was happy and I kept hearing this word happy, happy, happy and I didn't know what happy was. I got to the age of 16 and I was married and when I walked into the marital home I first of all noticed how small it was and they led me to a room and said this is your room downstairs, we sleep upstairs but you don't and the room was like a makeshift cupboard with a small bed and an open um, space for clothes. They took all of my gold that I was wearing for the wedding ceremony. They took all of my belongings and they handed me old things and said I must get a job. I didn't really ever speak to the person I was married to. He was living his life, he was happy. I don't think people understand that cultures like mine, the in-laws, play a very big part in mental abuse and physical abuse and often sexual abuse. It's not spoken about because there's a taboo, is a stigma of saying anything, but the amount of mental abuse a bride or a girl experiences from her in-laws is actually 
it destroys that person. I was told that I would do all of the cooking and there was no door so that I could be accessible to my father-in-law who would come in and rape me and attack me and threaten me. He had a real craving for control and to scare me, which he did. There was a thing in the 90s called the bride burning, which meant there was a lot of brides being burnt in the area I lived. And what I mean by that is they were giving their husbands baby girls. So the women from the community and the mother-in-laws and the father-in-laws would blame the bride and they would pour petrol over the girl and set her on fire. And the police would turn up and disappear thinking it was a suicide and they would say that they didn't know what to do, they didn't want to get mixed up in it. So I was literally dodging my father-in-law because on the weekends he would tie me up with metal coat hangers around my ankles and the metal would actually ding into my skin and he would strip me so I couldn't move. I would sit there and um, soil myself because I couldn't use the bathroom. And I was really, really scared. I was scared of everything. I was very skinny because I had an eating disorder. Every time I would plate some food at the end of preparing a meal, my mother-in-law would throw it into the dustbin. And tell me... She would tell me to eat out of the bin. Because she said, it's not your father's house. And you don't deserve to eat like one of them. And at first, I used to try and get food out of the bin because I was hungry. But then I just gave up. Sorry. Are, are you ready to, uh, to keep going? Thank you. You mentioned that you had a job. How did it feel having that sense of independence finally? I actually started to discover me at work. I started to discover who I was. I got this job and I started to notice a different culture and I quite liked to take some control of my own life in the workplace. But I also wanted to do well because I thought if I earn more money for them, they might leave me alone. And I did make some friends which were very, who were very important in my journey, I guess. Um, in my second job that was selling kitchens on the phone, which I absolutely loved, because it meant I was constantly on the phone talking to people. I met um, an Indian girl who had a Nigerian boyfriend and we connected because we were both Indian, but she would notice things and she would say, why are your ankles bleeding? You know, why do you have bruises? And I felt I could trust her. So I started to tell her things and she didn't judge. She didn't judge or, or make me feel stupid or silly. She actually would just listen. And then one day she said, you know, my parents weren't very understanding, but they are now because I'm older. Why don't you go back to your parents' house if you're so scared and so unhappy? And I started to, again, dream about things because I was a daydreamer. I started to almost visualise this um, fairy tale of walking into my parents' home and them holding me tightly and telling me that they loved me and they were proud of me because I think that's what every person wants their parents to be like, to give them that love. So I went to work one day and I never went back. I got onto a bus to my parents' house and, and I was sat on the bus and know, you know, and know, and knowingly celebrating to myself that I'm going back home. I'm, it's something I'm familiar with, you know, it's my home and I'll be able to see my dog and I'll be able to speak to my mum, not even thinking that you never spoke to your mum. Life was never that good at home. What happened when you did arrive home? I wasn't scared for the first time. I was kind of excited to see my family. I hadn't seen them for four years. And my father opened the door. I was a little bit surprised he was at home because it was during the day. It was mid-afternoon. And immediately he pulled me in by my ponytail and dragged me in. And I thought, I've just made the biggest mistake of my life. He took me into the same room in which I was raped. My brother was there, my eldest brother. My mum was there, my sister-in-law was there, and they started to beat me. And 
This was a different kind of beating. It was almost as though they were determined to kill me. And all my life I'd been threatened that we will bury you under these floorboards. And I really believed they would. I remember my do dog barking in the other room. They'd shut her up in the other room so she wasn't able to come near me. And I desperately wanted out, but I didn't know how to get there. Um, my father is an ex-professional wrestler. My brother's six foot tall and I was this very thin, small, 21-year-old. And within no time, they'd broken my jaw. They had broken my arm. And I was in a lot of pain. I was literally bouncing off the walls like a little rag doll. And I fell to the floor. You'd never forget what people say and how they say it. And they were telling me I was a disappointment, that they knew that this would happen because I was a girl and they didn't want that girl. They should have killed me from birth. And what they meant by that is when I was born, a lot of girls were put into plastic bags and suffocated and buried in the garden. And I know this because people would come to my mum's house and give birth to a girl and not report the birth, so nobody knew about the pregnancy. So I was always told I was very lucky to be alive and I was really scared of dying. Um, my brother started to kick me, my father started to stomp on me and they displaced my hip and there was probably no part of my skin that wasn't cut or covered with bruises or blood. It came to a time where my father held his foot on my throat and I felt at that moment I left my body and I remember looking at myself and thinking, this is it, this is, this is it now for you. But I heard something, it sounds strange, but it's what I believe and I know what happened. And something said to me, not yet, it's not your time just yet. And I remember going back into the body and feeling nothing. I was numb. I knew they were still kicking and punching and, and, you know, stamping on me, but I wasn't feeling anything. All I was doing was watching blood literally drip from my head onto my nose and into the carpet. And they continued. I remember feverishly looking up towards my mum and my sister-in-law, maybe in a way to ask for help. And I remember them standing with their arms crossed and they were very, very angry. And before I knew it, my other brother walked in, shouted, not here. And they all just disappeared very quickly. And I remember passing out and coming to and passing out. And the door opened and somebody said, they're going to take you to India, ask for help. It's security. And I thought, what a silly thing to say to me, because if I have my brother on one side and my father on the other, I'm not going to ask for help. And I thought to myself, I'm already dead. I don't want to live anymore. But then this little voice was saying, no, I don't want to die. And I tried to get myself up, but I couldn't. I tried to, like almost like a, a baby, crawl and I couldn't. So I started to talk to myself and I said, if you can get to the door and you can reach the handle, you've only got to get to the kitchen. If you can get to the kitchen, you've only got to get to the back garden. If you can get to the back garden, you will be free. I didn't even know what free meant or where I would go, but I knew I had to get out of there. And um, it sounds very fictional, I know. And I know I look literally like something out of a horror movie, but I started to move and my body was stiff because I'd laid in the same position for days and I was dirty and smelly. And like I said, I was covered in blood everywhere. But I did, I started using this part of my arm and I shuffled forward and I would fall I would internally cry because I was too scared to make a noise. I knew I had a very small window of opportunity before this angry household would know that I'm trying to escape. But I did, and I got to the door, and then I got to the kitchen, and when I got to the garden, my father had this six-foot-high wall, and I thought, I'm not going to be able to do this. And I sat there, literally, and thought, oh, I can't do it. And my dog came. And she was the loudest person. She would bark. She would make so much noise. The neighbours would complain. And I remember touching her wet nose and, and almost begging her not to say anything. And I really believe sometimes in life we really come to a crossroads where we just need one person to say, you've got this, in whatever form they come. And I believe in angels. And I 
felt she was this messenger or an angel saying to me, go, because she looked up and she looked back at me. And somehow I managed to get on top of this fence and then I fell on the other side in quite a loud way, thinking they might hear me. But I crawled, literally crawled, over to a little park opposite my house and I passed out in the bushes and they never found me. And when I woke up, it was early hours of the morning. I have no idea what time it was, but the birds were singing and I managed somehow to get to a taxi rank, which wasn't too far away. And when I got there, I had no money. I could barely stand. And the person that came to me was this white British man and he was so kind and he said, who's after you, what's happened? And I said, my parents are trying to kill me. And he got me into the back of his taxi, covered me with a blanket and said, where do, am I taking to the hospital, to the police? And I said, no, can you take me to my friends, please? And he did. He took me to a place called Market Harbour, which is in Leicestershire, where my friends lived. But nobody answered the door. But he didn't leave me. He stayed with me and eventually took me to the police station. And I remember collapsing in the police station. And I remember the policeman saying what happened, what happened, started to take photos. And um, I told him it was an attempted honour killing. He almost looked disappointed and uncomfortable and like he didn't know what to do and he said the best thing for you to do is to get to a hospital and before I know it I was on my own in a hospital lying on this bed nobody visited me nobody asked me who I was the nurses would come and do their observations and disappear without looking at me as though I was there I watched the people in each bed and their families and I knew he was coming at what time. But I also knew that nobody was coming for me. Have you had any communication with your family since, since you left? My brother came looking for me 15 years after I had moved out because he had attacked his partner at the time with a hammer and the police had put him into some sort of programme whereby he didn't have to do jail time if he put right what he had ever done in his life. And he said to them openly that he had attacked me in an honour killing attempt. And I was scared because I was still scared of my brother and he asked for forgiveness. And I said, I forgave you all a long time ago, but I just cannot forget. People don't understand why I've forgiven them, but I forgave them the moment they did something wrong because that's the kind of person I was. I don't speak to my parents now. I have been continuously threatened and um, haunted by them, whereby they have said they will behead me. So I get 30 to 40 death threats every month, not just from them, but from people I don't even know, especially the Middle East. And the way they look at it is if you leave an arranged marriage, they have to kill you to retain that honor and I understand the importance of speaking out regardless of stigma and shame because they will continue to do these things over and over again. So whoever it is you're protecting, the first and only person you should be protecting is yourself. I don't speak out out of hate for my culture or to bring disrespect to Indians or Sikhs or Punjabis, whoever you may be. It's not for that reason. It's to say that as humans, we should value life. Whether it's born, that child is born a girl or a boy, they are a precious life. And he became very violent, pushing me a lot, pushing me down the stairs, pushing me in the wall, grabbing my hair and pushing it into the passenger side if he was driving. And I didn't know I was in a violent situation until things were very serious. And when I was pregnant with my third child, and I was seven and a half, eight months pregnant, and he pushed me down the stairs. Oh, sorry. I fell, and he left. And I remember not feeling my baby move. 
he looked young, he did look young, but it was after the, the marriage that I knew that he was twice my age, so I was 15, he was 30. I knew, I knew he was gonna rape me, and that's what happened. And it, it became like every single day, 